Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jennifer Gill, and I'm the Director of Product Marketing at Zerto. And I have with me Shannon Snowden, and he's our Senior Technical Marketing Architect. And today we're going to talk about Zerto Virtual Replication. So before we move on from the first screen, I just want everyone to be aware of one thing, and that is we will take questions um, throughout the webinar and definitely at the end. What you can do is use the questions pane that's in the GoToWebinar panel. For me, it showed up on the right-hand side of my screen. So if you open that up, um, you can type in a question, and Shannon and I will do our very best to answer that. Um, before we move on for the first screen, too, one more other thing that I would be admonished for if I didn't point out, and that is um, all our awards. So you can see we got Best of Show in 2011, as well as the Gold Award for Business Continuity and Data Protection. And we added other awards um, for Product of the Year and Storage Magazine Product of the Year. Just to um, note the excellence that our product is being recognized for. And we're very, very proud of that. So here is our agenda for today. We're going to be talking about Zerto, look at the impact of virtualization on BCDR. We'll go through the product. And then I will turn it over to Shannon. And he'll take you through a few features of the product. We'll look at uh, what does BCDR look like without Zerto, talk about a, about a couple of our wonderful customers, and then summary, and then again, we'll take questions throughout and at the end of the webinar as well. So if we take a step back and, look, and take a look at what virtualization has changed, so in the hypervisor is where, you know, essentially all the action is. So service has been virtualized, network ha networking has been virtualized, and security has been virtualized. Having that alignment within the IT infrastructure ensures that all the benefits of virtualization transcend those other components. So you get mobility, flexibility, um, and better usage of your assets. One thing that had not been put into the hypervisor is replication. And companies were doing replication in the storage layer, usually. And that really undermined the virtualization strategy, because you had this beautiful virtualization strategy for service networking, and then you're trying to force fit this physical process into your virtual environment. So Zerto, recognizing that, took replication from the physical layer and pulled it up into the hypervisor. So all the benefits that you got with virtualization are now extended to your BCDR strategy. And with that, we have Zerto Virtual Replication. So it's virtual aware. And what do I mean by that? I mean, we replicate VMs and VMDKs. We don't care about MUNs. Any of the physical constructs of the environment are not important to us. It's a software-only solution, so it scales really, really nicely, especially for those larger environments. And it's Tier 1 enterprise class replication and recovery. So what do I mean there? Very aggressive service levels. Um, RPOs of seconds, RTOs of minutes. We deliver application consistency and point in time recovery. So I'm going to run through a very simple architecture. And I say simple because here we have two sites, and we are able to protect multiple sites. There are two components of the software, the Zerto Virtual Manager and the Zerto Virtual Replication Appliance. You can see that the Zerto Virtual Manager plugs right into vCenter Server. It's just an additional tab, and Shannon will show you that in the demo. And the Zerto Virtual Replication Appliance is a very lightweight piece of software. It installs on each ESX host within the environment. It's not on a per VM basis, on a per ESX host basis, and that's what does the replication. So here you can see we can replicate from anything to anything. You see that we have NetApp, IBM, EMC. Again, because we are in the hypervisor, 
We don't care about the underlying storage. So you can use an older array or a different brand of storage at your application site because hopefully a failover or disasters or something that's happening often and you don't need to have that very large investment sitting there idle waiting for a disaster. As I mentioned, it is a software-only solution, so it's highly scalable. You can see that those uh, virtual appliances, those are just lightweight pieces of software. We don't have any physical components of the solution in the environment. It's a software-only solution. And Shannon, would you like to talk about our aggressive service levels? Sure. So the, it, we showed that we got an RPO second. So how, how is that possible? Well, what, the way it's possible is on the protected site, we're not really storing anything. So there's no, um, there's no sync or no snapshot, no schedule that has to happen from the protected site. What there is is a journal at the recovery site. And the way that we are architected, we replicate as soon as it is being written from the VM to the storage. We intercept that and replicate it. So that gives you the recovery point of uh, what we often see is seconds in, with production workloads. Now, what we'll go through in the demos, and Jen will talk a bit more about in a few minutes, is, is the, uh, the process that we go through and what the, what the uh, alert settings are and things. We'll, we'll look at all that. But what our goal is is to be as close to zero RPO as possible, and we often see very, very low uh, uh, seconds of RPO in the production environments. Can you want to talk about the journaling? I don't know. Can you see that update there? Yeah, we see the update. Uh, on the, uh, the, the journal, it, it goes back up to five days and we are able to do point in time recoveries from any of those points in time in the, in the journal. So it's essentially, as Jen, as you say, it's a TiVo for, uh, for your uh, VR. And it's, it's a very accurate uh, idea of what that point in time recovery allows you to do. I can, I can pick a point in time, and as we'll see in the demo, multiple points in time. I can do application consistent points in time if I'm running VSS or um, uh, something that creates uh, the app in Linux. We can also get a checkpoint that's application consistent too. So we've got uh, very, very robust capability there. And when you think about a failover, um, the point in time recovery allows you to have that very low RTO as well, that recovery time, because we don't have any of those scheduled syncs or final sync for, from the source location to the target location. It's just not needed because our journal is at the destination site already. Further enhancing that is the bandwidth optimization. So we, we have built in compression uh, per virtual protection group, and Jen will talk about that concept in a second. But, um, we're able to see in production around a 50% savings on your bandwidth usage. Often, and Jen, you do a lot of the, you do all the case studies. Um, I think one of the most frequent uh, comments you hear is we're using a lot less bandwidth than we thought we would. Yeah, I get that a lot actually. Um, so with the compression, people see about 50% compression rate and that's actually one of the points you'll see in both the case studies at the end that you know customers are able to reduce their bandwidth requirements by 40 percent so that's a big deal especially for some of the smaller environments you know I was talking with this one guy he had um, a one gig pipe so for him it's not a big deal although he did like seeing the reduction in uh, network utilization so even for a big customer it's important but for small customers that's you know a really big deal for them so thanks Shannon um, and actually, this is, I think this slide will answer one of our questions that we have. So someone asked, if it's on a per host basis, can you vMotion while replicating? And you'll see here on the slide that through the VPG, we're able to fully support vMotion, HA, storage vMotion, et cetera. So because we put those uh, VRAs on each host, we know where VMs are being moved throughout the environment. 
And the basis for that is the virtual protection group. So this is the unit that we use for protection. So if you have a group of VMs that support an application, which is very typical, you'll have more than one VM for a, a multi-tier application, like a database VM, web VM, and an app VM. So you can put those together in a group and tell Zerto, manage these together as one entity. And no matter where they get moved in the environment through vMotion, uh, DRS, or HA, Zerto will track that and say, okay, no matter where these guys go, I need to protect them in the exact same, um, exact same way. So you'll get uh, consistent uh, RTOs across those, consistent RTOs, and it allows you to configure on a group basis. So things like boot order, so if you want the database server available first, then the app server, then the web server, and also re-IP configuration if you need to do that as well. Um, and as Shannon mentioned, on the app support, you can see here that we support VSS. Okay. Actually, Shannon, before we move on, did you have anything to add here? I'm sorry, Shannon. Uh, other than just uh, to drive your point that, uh, and what I'll show in the demo, is that those virtual protection groups, that, that same infrastructure can support multiple sites. So we have, in fact, we did a webinar, uh, 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 a VMUG last week, uh, with one of our customers who has eight remote sites going to two main data centers. He's able to set up his replication very mixed based off of virtual protection groups. So that's your layer granularity of being able to uh, send one virtual protection group to maybe site A and another virtual protection group to site B and have the same backend infrastructure supporting really going to two, two separate sites. Okay, great. And then we've talked a lot about replicating the data, but that is not a full BCDR solution. So we also need to talk about the orchestration. It's one thing to get the data over to the target site, but you also need to be able to use it. You need to be able to bring those VMs up and make everything available. So we have full orchestration capabilities, and they're fully automated, because when you're in the middle of a high-pressure situation, any manual step is an opportunity for error. So you've automated as much as possible so that when you're in that high pressure situation, everything will work as advertised. So we replicate the virtual machines over to the, uh, the sorry, replicate the data over to the replication site. So all the data is there that's needed to build the VMs upon failover. So when you do decide to execute a failover, Zerto will begin to build those virtual machines. So we don't have shadow VMs hanging out on the replication site. They're built and this, because we've included things like boot order and re-IP and all those things that I already mentioned, and all that's automated, we get a very, very aggressive RTO. So we see customers who have RTOs of, you know, 2 minutes, 43 seconds, 5 minutes, 22 seconds. So they know that they're going to have their application up and running in just a few minutes. Shannon, would you like to talk about the testing? Absolutely. So the click, click the test anytime really plays into how do you know what your RTO is going to be. Um, and Jim, you know, we, we have customers who can tell us what the RTO is on any number of their VPGs, the, those virtual protection groups, um, down to, as you were saying, two minutes and 45 seconds. Essentially, it's the boot time it takes for that VPG for all the VMs to come up. And the way that we do it is uh, we do non-disruptive testing to where you can put the test during the middle of the day to check whether your boot order is correct, your IP address has changed, if you need to add a script in. You get all that work done ahead of time to where, to Jen's point, when you're in a uh, recovery situation, you want to be able to push the button and have high level of confidence that your failover is going to happen successfully. That happens so successfully so often that we have a lot of customers who, that do disaster avoidance. And what they'll do is just plan when it's hurricane season, we're going to fail a data center over to Dallas from Houston. Okay. 
And the off-site cloning feature, so once you have all the information over at the target site, so it's there already, so you might as well get some use out of it. So you're able to clone a VM or a VPG, have that available at the replication site, and now you have production quality application and data to do things like test and development, or since it's an exact copy, why don't you take a backup, backup off of the target site instead of doing it off your production environment. You know, why put any more load on those production servers that are doing things that are so critical for your environment? Do it at the replication site. So, and as I mentioned, we do multi-site support. So Shannon actually was in Atlanta last week, uh, presenting as one of our great customers. So he has something, I don't know, it doesn't look exactly like this, but he does have two main data centers. He has eight other remote locations that are replicating over. So he's able to see that entire environment, all eight sites, into a single pane of glass. So we do bi-directional replication between sites, and then also, you can, as you can imagine, this is a great use case for our cloud providers. Because cloud providers want to be able to have more than one customer, so you know, multi-site replication is important for them. But it's a great way to evaluate the cloud with disaster recovery as a service, because again, this isn't something that's happening every day. It's kind of more of a once in a while kind of thing. And we do support uh, secure multi-tenancy, so you can replicate multiple sites to one shared infrastructure. So again, able to keep operational and capital costs down by leveraging that one shared infrastructure. And then, Shin, you want to talk about uh, one of our new features that we just announced? Sure. So we've got the, uh, a lot of customers who uh, either are, are um, cloud service providers or enterprises that have remote locations. And they manage the remote location with a single vCenter. Now in the 3.0 that we announced before VMworld, um, we support single vCenter. We call that Robo, Remote Branch Office Workload. Um, we're able to, uh, you can fail over between uh, resource pools, clusters, what have you, from that centralized data center. Now, obviously, a single vCenter, if it fails, then your environment's in jeopardy, but uh, for those environments that uh, need this type of deployment, we support that. Great. Thanks, Shannon. And I think at this point, yes, I am turning it over to you. So, Shannon, I'm going to make you the presenter. Okay. And what I'm going to do is show a, uh, a uh, we're going to show setting up a VPG. We're going to do a, a test failover and we'll look at our environment um, from a couple of different interfaces that we have now, which is um, uh, the plug-in to vSphere client, but also our web-based UI. So let's, uh, let's get to it, shall we? Sure. And actually, Shannon, someone asked a question. Um, and we're setting this up. So are the host agents automatically deployed? Yeah, so when uh, you deploy the Zerto Virtual Manager, what you'll do is there's a couple of steps. The first step is you you um, pair sites, and then you deploy the VP, the VRAs, the virtual replication appliances, and you'll see those VRAs show up in the inventory of your of your vSphere client. They, they're down here. So there's a there's a VRA, there's a VRA, and that's associated with my two hosts that's in this particular cluster. And uh, that's really, um, th those are little Linux appliances, and they're deployed for each host in your cluster. That way you, you don't get into a, sort of an orphan scenario where um, you, you've got multiple hosts in the cu cluster that may not have a VRA. That would be a bad thing. So let's take a bit yeah, of a no, tour. Oh, go ahead, Jim. So sorry, Shannon. The only thing I want to know is because, um, so as Shannon mentioned, we call these appliances, and the reason is because agents require ongoing maintenance, updates, patching, etc. Our appliances do not. So it's a very, very low touch solution. The simplicity is what makes it so powerful. So sorry, Shannon. I just wanted to get that point in. Over to you. 
Well, I think that's an important point to make that um, let's, everything gets upgraded. So uh, we, when we, we just announced 3.0, so there's an upgrade. But it's a single product. And if you think about us versus other solutions, you're not upgrading storage, some replication, um, software, um, an orchestration product. You're, you don't have to match all of that up and make sure all the versions are matching. We're very simple. We work with vSphere uh, 4.1 all the way up through the latest. As soon as 5.5 is GA and released, we have already, you know, we'll be supporting that. And then when you get ready to upgrade Zerto, you upgrade uh, one product. And the, the VRAs, the, Z, the ZVM, that's all upgraded nice and cleanly, and it's one vendor, and it's, and it's uh, one throat to choke if you can think of it that way, too. If you're not trying to have hardware vendors versus software vendors and, and things of that nature during the upgrade. And that's one of the, uh, of all the advantages that Zerto has over the competition, this is one of the largest, is uh, you're, you're upgrading both your replication and orchestration at the same time, one product, not multiple products. So let's take a tour of what we look like from the vSphere client, and then I'll do most everything else from the web UI simply because it's a, you know, bigger landscape, more to work with. I want to um, set us up here to see where we are. So I'm at the primary DC, and this is my summary screen. So it's telling me that I've got um, multiple peers, and, and that gets to what the, the United States uh, drawing was showing with multiple sites, multiple connections. Well, that's what we're showing here is we have multiple sites involved in this layout. So let's look at the topology quickly. See, I've got multiple sites going on here. I've got some of them named customer. This is just, they can be called anything, site two, um, site three. It doesn't really matter. We can change those names. But from my local site, I've got, I, I've made site pairings between the local site and, and the second DC and customer two and customer one and the third DC. And uh, so that's, that's my connections. And what I can do with these connections is I can create VPGs bidirectionally and replicate them from one site to my local site or my local site to one of these any of these other sites. So there's a great amount of flexibility and um, power with the ease of use of just pairing up two sites. Okay, so let's look at the inventory of our virtual protection groups. Now that was the concept that Jennifer introduced of how we collect together uh, multiple VMs or even a single VM into some logical unit that we want them all to be together to fail over at the same time and boot in a specific sequence. So that's what we have um, with our VPGs. And then here's my list of VPGs that are in my inventory of machines being protected. And these are being replicated I can see these are being replicated from the primary to primary in this one. So what does that mean? Primary to primary, which is the source and target. See this little crooked uh, arrow here means that's a single vCenter solution. So my Tampa VM is actually in a resource pool here in Tampa. And it's just re uh, replicating to essentially another resource pool. We'll, we'll, we'll have a, I would fail it over. But this could be between clusters or um, it could be between, uh, um, again, resource pools like I've got. So the next set of icons, so that, that was vCenter to vCenter, see these little icons? And then the next set of icons are blue. That means that's a vCloud director to vCloud director. And if I go down a little bit further, I've got, I've got a combination of vCenter to vCloud director. So as you can see, the point here is we really can work with any VMware uh, solution and work natively. So the primary DC can support both vCloud director to vCloud director, but it can also support vCenter to vCenter. That same backend infrastructure can support this, the uh, single vCenter support. It's all the same Zerto backend, it's just how it's being used. Because we're at the virtualization layer and the hypervisor layer, 
we have a lot of freedom. All right. All right. So let's go to a VM and let's set up a virtual protection group. All right. So now I've. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to get here. I just selected the VM in the inventory, and I'm going to create a virtual protection group. And I could make this a standalone, or I could add this to an existing one. In this case, I'm going to create a new VPG. Now, considering that I've paired up all those sites, look at all my uh, choices even including my local site, which means that would be a single vCenter robo um, uh, configuration. I'm going to select my, uh, let's see, let's select the second data center. Now, I know that's not a vCloud director data center, and if it were, this little area here would light up to say that that's a vCloud director data center. So I continue, and it goes into my create VPG screen. So I'll call this uh, demo VPG. I'm going to go down here and uh, choose custom because um, the the uh, profiles that are being sent to it are from our cloud product, which is sort of cloud manager, which basically is the simplest out these next set of settings, but I can go custom and, and do this myself. So every uh, every virtual protection group uh, comes in as medium by default as far as priority. So just like in uh, vCenter, if I want to make something higher priority, it gets more shares than something at medium or low. So it's the same concept, only in this case, what we're dictating is only in the event of bandwidth contention does this priority come into play at all. So if these, if this, uh, if this VPG has virtual machines in it that I consider higher priority, which would get more of the bandwidth, then I would tell it to be a high priority. Now our target RPO, this is when you're going to start getting alerted. So we were talking about. Um, how our RPO is in seconds, and the default is five minutes. That is when you're going to get an alert, not what the RPO is going to be. What the RPO is going to be can be tracked real time with Z, ZVR, our product, to tell you that it's going to be in the seconds normally, um, and it's going to be far less than five minutes. I may set this at five minutes simply because I need to get alerted if it goes past five minutes because in our world, that's really starting to be a high RPO. And in, I mean, think about it. If you compare us with other products, that would be a very optimistic RPO for them to be able to, to, to achieve. And some, it's not even possible to achieve that. So we are taking it from zero is where we want to be, and you start getting alerted, and it can be alerts all the way up through uh, a 12-hour window and all the way down to a 10-second RPO, so that would be, uh, that'd be pretty aggressive, and that's only when you're going to... five days, and so we can set that here initially at 24 hours, and then we can extend that uh, journal to add an extra 96 hours to get that full five days. Now, we also need to do some calculations, and we have a, a, a helper tool that helps you figure out, in order for me to go back five days, how big does my journal need to be based on you know, the, the performance of the machines that are in the virtual protection group. That's what it's all based on is CIO and what what the changes are. And so you, you do a bit of calculations and you can come up with the right balance of how big your journal needs to be. The test frequency is built into the product. Uh, it's one of those 
automation things that uh, streamlines workflows. If I have an agreement with the application owner that owns this virtual protection group, or the VMs in it, that every six months we will run a DR test, then I can get a reminder from our product that, hey, it's time to test you know, the HR VPG or the finance VPG. And you can stay within your uh, SLAs and your agreements with those departments. Now, the WAN compression we were talking about earlier, this is how you set it. It's a checkbox. And so you enable the sort of WAN compression, or you disable it if you're using something uh, a tool like uh, Silver Peak, for example, or uh, Riverbed that is doing WAN compression maybe for your whole site. Uh, this will compress the traffic for the VPG if you just check that box. And as I was saying earlier, we see about a 50% bandwidth savings. OK. So let's go over to set up our where we want this to go. So we can go to resource pools at the target location. So this is setting up the target location. So I've set up how I want my alerts to be, my RPOs and everything to be. And now I'm setting up just the data store that I want it to go to the network that I want to see it show up on. And I can have different networks if I want for the failover move network, which is the, the thing of your production, um, or a test network. So I can separate those out. So if I'm running one of those non-disruptive tests, it would use this network as opposed to the production network. And then I'll just pick a default folder here. Now, if I wanted to, I could add multiple VMs, and this is where they would show up in this list. Right now, I've got one in there. And what we want to do is look at the configuration of that one VM. Because I may want to tweak some things. Notice I've got a couple of VMDKs that are associated with this. And that's all they are, are VMDKs. So let's say that this, this VMDK is actually a swap disk. Well, I can configure that to be a swap disk by checking this box. What swap disk does is it tells Zerto to do the initial replication, make sure everything is done, but don't replicate after you've done the first full replication. So that saves on bandwidth of not replicating swap data or whatever kind of data they would be on there. Some people use it for Maybe there's you know, some files or something on a, on a drive that doesn't really ever need to be updated, so they just turn that off. There's different use cases, but for the main one, that, that would be a, a swap disk. We can also change, I'm going to take that back off, by the way. Uh, we can also change the recovery data storage. So if I need, let's say this is, uh, I've got tier one storage and I've got uh, tier three storage, maybe this VM is, um, this one VMDK needs faster storage, you know, more spindles, higher speed RPM, uh, disk, whatever. I can be very granular to the VM inside the virtual protection group down to the VMDK level of the VM to set that. Otherwise, it's going to take the default VPG settings, as you see in the background there. I can make this a thin disk, which is going to come in as a default. Or by unchecking the box, I can change that to a thick disk. So it will go thin to thick, thick to thin, thick to thick, however I want to do that. Now, the next radio button here is raw disk, the RDMs. Um, since I don't have any RDMs presented to this cluster, it's grayed out. But if I did, and I had this particular VMDK was actually mapping to an RDM, then this is where I would pick the correct RDM for it to go to. And then we do both virtual mode and physical mode RDMs, which is unlike um, uh, a lot of products have the cap capability of doing. But you're able to uh, use RDMs in your, uh, in your protection as well. OK. Now, a very commonly used feature is the pre-seed. So what the pre-seed does is, let's say I have a terabyte of data at the source site, and I need to get that to 
um, the target site. I can either create a VPG and just let it replicate over a long period of time, and, and it'll get there eventually. But that's a terabyte of data going across your wire. Uh, maybe a more efficient use would be uh, dumping that data to a NAS device, a USB drive, something, FireWire, whatever. Get it, take it to the destination site, dump those VMDKs to a data store that that cluster can see, the VMware cluster can see, and then all I have to do is map to that data store to the correct VMDKs using my pre-seed. So here, of course, I don't have one set up, but I would just keep drilling into these folders until I found, see, it's telling me there, this isn't the right VMDK for the VPG, the VM that you're trying to map to. That's what the old symbol means. So there's a sanity check in there to make sure you don't pick the wrong one. But that's the use case, uh, you know, for preceding is is getting you up to speed very quickly um, with large amounts of data to be synced between your source site and your target site. Now the NICs, um, I can configure the network cards to, I can change their IP configuration during a failover. <laughs> during a failover test or an actual failover. So if I have a DHCP server at, this, at the uh, target site, I can use it, or I can go to static, and I can set the IP addresses for the failover production network at the, at the, uh, at the remote site, or during my testing, maybe I've got a different IP address scheme I want to use, I can go in there and set the static um, IP address for my testing. I can also change the actual, be very granular and change perhaps the network uh, that I want the test to go to per VM. So it's, and per NIC in the VM, just like the VMDKs in the VM, I think we can get very granular on this as well. Okay, so now, I don't necessarily save this, this configuration. So, um, so I've got this set up. And now all I would need to do, let's go down and see one other thing. So let's say you have um, some scripts that uh, you've done your non-disruptive testing, and you know that before I, um, before I bring these machines up, um, in a specific order, I need to run some scripts uh, to make a service start correctly. Every, everyone's got those servers that need a little script up, seems like. So this is where you would do it. In the failover workflow, you're able to add in scripts, either pre-recovery or post-recovery, that can do things uh, that normally you have to log in and do manually. But if you have a script for it, what you would do is you just put that in the uh, this area, and you put uh, uh, what you need to run, and you're able to, as part of the failover workflow, be able to kick some scripts that make sure that everything works correctly. Now, I mentioned boot order, so let's look at the boot order here. Now, I've only got one VM in here, so it's not going to be that exciting. But, as you can see, I could add startup delay, I could wait for the VMware tools to be ready. I, uh, you know, if I know that this, you know, this machine just takes X amount of time for it to start. Let's say it takes an additional 30 seconds. Well, I could put it into a folder in my boot order and let uh, let us know that that machine needs to be delayed before it starts up the next machine because it just takes longer for it to get going. Okay, so that's what we can do with boot order. And we can, um, if I had the uh, whole list of VMs in here, I would just set up their boot order for to make sure that my non-disruptive testing, that my RTOs are, are as short as they can be during an actual failover. All right, so I'm not going to save this, but we've set up a VPG. And now we're in, let me check. All right. 
So now I want to switch over to what I was telling you. My uh, my normal way of doing this is the web-based UI. So now, as you see, we're running this from a browser. I'm at a uh, at a remote site. This happens to be called customer. It could be called site one. So it's just a name here. This one is actually going. Uh, I want to show you a couple things here. Uh, with this particular DPG, this one's going to my primary data center, and then I've got another uh, DPG that's going vCenter to vCenter. It's actually going to another vCenter that I paired with. So if I look at the topology for this remote customer, it's actually paired with two different sites. So my third DC and my primary DC. So this could be um, uh, one of those situations where you've got um, just a satellite office that uh, you you have specific VPGs that you want to go to two different locations. If we look at the actual RPOs, notice it, that it's, it changes in nine seconds over here on this side, nine seconds and uh, uh, seven seconds earlier. We get a good view of everything just from the single pane of glass, um, and we get to see the last test that was run and some other things. So what I want to do is I'm going to take this particular VPG, I'm going to select it, and then I'm going to look at some of the information about this VPG. I think I was on mute. All right. Yes, you were. Um, <laughs> was there was there like a silent, a pregnant silence there? Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, so it was like um, 25 seconds. I was just about to jump in. So I think you were going over the current RPO 10 seconds was about when we lost you right there, Shannon. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think I bumped it with my phone. All right. So um, if we look at the summary side, we can look at when the last test was run. Yeah, but what I want to show you here is that the target org VDC. So in this one, I'm gonna we're gonna look at it from V center to V center, but I also want to show you that um, we're so integrated with the different VMware tools that you're able to see it um, if if it were going to uh, the cloud director into an org VDC of what that looks like as well. Since since we're here, we might as well show it, right? All right. So um, and that's what that little symbol over here shows you is the V center to the cloud director. And this is our target RPO, the history, and, and, and such. So if I were to create a checkpoint, this is not necessary to do, but let's say I was doing this, um, maybe I can um, explicitly put a checkpoint into our journal to say, hey, I know this was before an upgrade. So I want to make sure that I... Uh, I know that I have a very visible checkpoint that's before the upgrade. Now, I've done the checkpoint. So now what we want to do is we want to do a test failover. Now let's look at the three steps that it takes. So this is showing me the VPG name that was created, where it's coming from, and where it's going to. In this case, this is my VPG. VPG going from my source site of customer one to my target site of primary DC. And the next thing I want to do is it's asking me, well, what checkpoint do you want? And I can go, well, I like 
the last checkpoint, or uh, maybe a checkpoint that I defined, which was the four upgrade, the one I just created. Maybe I want to show, uh, you know, look at the time scale and slide back to the previous point in time. Or maybe I just want to manually select. I know exactly when I want to go back, what point in time I, I want to test from. And I can do that. So if we scroll down, we can see that we have multiple checkpoints being written. So I could go back a couple of days ago at 8 in the morning and select that one. And that's where I would run the test from. I'm just going to run the last one since, uh, since we're here. And let's go next. And we'll do the test fail over. Now, what we're going to see up here in the upper right is it's telling me that I'm starting a test fail over. And it's going to start doing some, some, uh, some things. And I can see those things if I look in, uh, in vCenter. And also, I can see some things if I look over back at the production site. I'm going to the primary uh, DC, so see this, hey, I've got from the source location, they started a failover test. And the failover test is 25% complete. If I go back to the source location where I initiated it from, it shows me I'm 25% complete. Now, um, this is vCenter to vCenter, right? Because I'm just looking at what's protected. This is my inventory. I could see this. Let's go down to vCenter into vCenter 1, and I'll show you what it looks like in the actual vSphere client, just, just to line everything up. And see, same view, and I'm showing starting a failover operation. And if you notice down at the bottom, the task, there's a lot of stuff going on. That's because everything that we're doing is integrated into the VMware products. So it's integrated into vCenter. And then now I want to take you back to the web-based view because we're going to look at some stuff from another perspective, vCloud Director. So if I look at just take a peek at vCloud Director, if I were if I were running a, you know an internal infrastructure as a service or something, then maybe I have the end users logging into vCloud Director to do their test. And we see that the testing recovery is showing up into the org VDC that was created. So this is a um, how integrated we are, as you can see some different views of, the, of this going on. But I could run the test, and I could do all the functionality testing. If it's just vCenter to vCenter, if I'm the admin and I don't want to go to the vCloud director, then I can see the same view. Now, if I go back over to my where I initiated it from, it shows that this test is in progress. So now I could select that VM, um, log into it, make sure everything's happy. I could do that as well from this interface and the cloud director and I'm able to to see that regardless of the location I'm able to manage this event which is critical for a PR product to be able to interface into this. Now think of this. You can also use the tablet to do this because this is running running a web based UI. So we've actually done some failover testing using our tablets. Um, and you know, look and feel is, is, is perfectly fine. So I'm going to stop this test. And uh, the test was successful. And I'll stop this. And now we're going to start seeing some events. So I'm going to do sort of a cycle around here. Let's look at our vCenter. And we're going to see the cleanup starting initiated. See, it's starting to reconfigure the virtual machine. It's stopping the failover test. It's going to shut down the VM. It's going to uh, do a cleanup at this site. Because it's right now that it's a temporary virtual machine because it is um, a non-disruptive test. So let me go back to the web browser. And let's go over and see what it looks like from Again, a vCenter view. It's showing me that this test is being cleaned up. And this is the VVM view at that primary center. So it shows me a status. 
And then if I look at the cloud director, I hit refresh here, they should start, you know, see it goes away. So our cleanup workflow even is down into the cloud director as well. All right, so that one is done. Okay, so that um, sort of takes you through, uh, you know, a quick view of setting up a v VPG and then doing a test failover and then seeing it from the source site, target site, and then if you have vCloud Director integration, the vCloud, the vCloud Director interface as well. So a little bonus there since we, we mentioned it. What I do want to show next is, and Jim's going to talk a little bit more in depth, that can run recovery reports. And one of the recovery reports would look a lot like this that shows every step. And it shows if it was successful or if it failed, what the VPG was, what the duration of the test was, and how long it took. You can export this, send it to the manager. Or, Jan, as we have some customers doing, they actually provide links to the, these reports via the web UI, and they let the management generate their own reports uh, whenever they want. Yeah, that's a great use case actually for the web UI. So some of you might have someone who needs to get access to reports, but you might not want to give them vCenter access. So the web interface is a way to get around that. All right, Jim. So I think I was uh, I think I showed everything I wanted to over here. So I'll give you the uh, presentation back. Okay, great. So you have a couple more questions. Um, I do want to get through the slides. I'm going to go through these a little bit faster. So basically what this slide is to show is that when you're coordinating a physical replication procedure into a virtual environment, there are many, many steps involved. And it's really a complex, manual, and inflexible process. And with Zerta, we take all those steps and get it down to five. So you can see it's much easier to use a hypervisor-based replication solution in a virtual environment. So as Shannon mentioned, we have some reports here. So we have the recovery report. So that's great for auditors because they'll ask, hey, do we have a BCDR process? What's it look like? You know, how can I recover this particular application? So you can run that uh, recovery report and give that to them. We also have detailed reports for resource planning and performance charts. So you can kind of see what's happening within the environment and see if you need to add more storage, more bandwidth, whatever it is. You can see we have resource planning reports. So what's interesting about the resource planning reports is they don't show, they show the VM um, usage not just at the production site, but also at the target site. So you can see how resources are being consumed in both places. And then Shannon mentioned this customer, uh, Whitworth National Bank. So they do disaster avoidance. So they are located in Houston, and, and Houston, as you all know, you get hit with hurricanes if you live there. So they sail everything over in May, June time frame from Houston, move it over to Austin, and then sail everything back in November. Before they implemented Zerto, this was taking two weekends of prep and one weekend of execution on both ends. So now with third of this tape, you know, a Saturday morning, as Shannon showed, you can do replication and moves and things like that during business hours, but where they have financial applications involved, they didn't want to do that. So they still do it on their weekends. And they were able to really capitalize on um, some regained investments. So they were using a 100 gigabyte LUN. They were using a LUN-based replication solution. So whether they were using 90 gigabytes of the 100 gigabyte LUN or 5 gigabytes of the 100 gigabyte LUN, um, they were replicating all 100 gigabytes. So that led to some inefficiencies on storage and also bandwidth. So you can see they were able to reduce their bandwidth requirements by 44% and their storage footprint by 25% just by leveraging Zerto. And Hoppo Credit Union, another great uh, case study. Actually, both of these case studies are up on our website if you'd like to read a little bit more detail. So they had 130 VMs and originally a 70 terabyte uh, storage footprint. Once they implemented Zerto, they were able to recapture 30 terabytes of storage. 
And they're, um, you know, not a small bank, but they're not really big. So for them, they were able to go to their board and say, hey, we don't know when we're going to need to buy storage again. So as you can imagine, that was a very well-received message. Um, and then we talked about uh, BC0 uh, being the replication solution for the cloud, whether it's your private cloud, and that's a lot of what we discussed today. If you want to do disaster recovery to a cloud provider, so DR the service. And then there might be some applications that are you know, problematic or kind of cranky, as Shannon calls them. So give it to the cloud provider altogether and let them manage the production and replication. So if you do have any questions, um, certainly feel free to email Shannon or myself. We have one minute, and I think we have two new questions that we can take. So one, um, someone asked, uh, what's the minimum bandwidth requirement? That one I can actually answer. It's uh, five megabits. So that's the minimum bandwidth required to use Zerto. And then Shannon, someone asked, um, are the VPGs, the, I'm sorry, the VRAs, those are pushed out automatically in the environment, correct? Right. What you do is you, um, you set the configuration parameters and the IP addresses and things and the host that you want it to go to. And then it's deployed. It's an OVF uh, file deployed by the, the ZDN. So the manager takes care of that after you've configured it and target what host you want it to go to. Right. The install normally takes about uh, an hour total is what you're looking at. And it's done via WebEx. Our support team's on with you. And part of that hour normally, the last, 20 to 30 minutes maybe uh, setting up some B BBGs and doing some uh, replication. So it's very, very simple deployment. Okay, great. So we are right at 2 o'clock, and I wanted to be cognizant of everyone's time. Um, if you did ask a question, we didn't get to it. Uh, someone will follow up with you, so don't worry about that. I will answer one more question. Someone asked if this is being recorded, and it is. And we'll, we will be posting that and making it available and you'll get a notification of that as well. So thank you so much for joining us today. We really love the questions. It's great when everyone's so interactive and participating. And we hope to see you on the next webinar. If you join us on October 8th, you can hear from Hoppo Community Credit. They'll be joining us at 1 o'clock Eastern. And you can register for that on our website. Thank you so much, and have a great day.